Hello everyone, my name is Arthur Giuliani, and I'm going to be talking about the work that I've done with my collaborators, Veronica Chelu, Laura Grasser, and Adam Saffron. Our project is titled The Dual Receptor Model of Serotonergic Psychedelics, Therapeutic Insights from Simulated Cortical Dynamics. So, first off, serotonergic psychedelics. These are a class of drugs which include psilocybin, LSD, DMT, among many others. They were extensively studied in the 1950s through 1970s for their therapeutic use, and they were also used therapeutically in a number of settings with some amount of success. These drugs were largely made illegal in the 1970s, at least in the United States, largely halting research progress for decades until the new millennia, where research has largely picked up again. There's been a lot of clinical investment, and there are even drug candidates currently going through FDA approval process um, for use in the treatment of mental health disorders. And it is the case that there's a fair amount of evidence that uh, psychedelic-assisted therapy can be effective in the treatment of a wide range of different mental disorders, ranging from depression and anxiety to addiction and OCD. Uh, phase two clinical trials, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, demonstrated that psilocybin-assisted therapy was as effective, if not more effective, than the standard SSRI treatment for major depressive disorder. Given the effectiveness of these drugs, it's reasonable to ask uh, what is the neural mechanism or psychological mechanism behind their therapeutic effects. One prominent theory which we build on in our work quite heavily is that of Robin Carhart Harris and Carl Friston, um, who hypothesized that the effect of psychedelics therapeutically largely comes from their ability to disrupt the representation of high level beliefs such that they can then be reevaluated in a psychotherapeutic setting um, such that the individual as psychological relief. Now, this disruption of beliefs can manifest in a number of different ways. The Card Harris and Friston model proposes this idea of relaxed beliefs under psychedelics, which they uh, call rebus. And an example of this would be the prototypical experience of oceanic boundlessness, which is also often described um, with people who use psychedelics, this feeling that the boundary of their body uh, it doesn't end at their skin, but it instead extends into space, perhaps extends even indefinitely. So that's relaxed beliefs. It's also the case, though, that under the effects of psychedelics, there can be strengthening of various forms of beliefs, at least transiently. Um, a good example of this is pareidolia. So pareidolia is uh, seeing shapes and patterns in ambiguous stimuli. So a, a classic example of this might be looking at a tree, looking at the tree bark, and seeing a face in the tree bark, where in fact there's just, you know, typical tree bark patterning. Um, another good example of this is the experience of psychological insight, which people often have um, when taking psychedelics. So it's very common for someone, for example, to experience uh, an intense feeling of having figured out something very important about their lives, about the universe. Um, and even if this only lasts for a few moments or a couple of minutes, uh, their sense of certainty in their um, experience is very, very high. And so really there's a kind of like whole range of these effects and uh, my collaborator Adam Saffron has described them collectively as altered beliefs under psychedelics. And I think, you know, collectively these altered beliefs effects are thought to be uh, causally relevant somehow for the therapeutic effects of psychedelics. The question then is, can we go from a kind of high level model like this to something more concrete? And so the goal of this work is to create a formal computational model of this altered beliefs effect um, that takes into account and is consistent with the current neuroscientific evidence for how psychedelics affect the brain. We also want this model to be grounded in the neurobiology of the cortex and the serotonin neuromodulatory system because these class of drugs act mainly on the serotonin receptor system. And lastly, we want this model to not only be consistent with current evidence, but also to have some predictive capacity such that it can hopefully guide future psychedelic drug discovery. So in order to accomplish these goals, we should start at the beginning, um, which is to, if these drugs affect the serotonin system, it's worth trying to understand what exactly the serotonin system is and how it works. Uh, so the serotonin uh, system kind of like starts or has its uh, central node in the midbrain, where there's the dorsal refe nucleus, and this nucleus um, is thought to compute 
a kind of uh, value signal or value representation of how successful the organism currently is um, at accomplishing its goals, predicting the world around it. And it also is computing these unsigned prediction errors, which are a measure of how off the organism might be in doing this. And it's the case within this model that um, large prediction errors then correspond to large downstream releases of serotonin into the cortex. So as you can see in the image here, from the dorsal raphe nucleus, you have these projections of the serotonin neurons all throughout the cortex. And the idea is that if there are these prediction errors that the organism is encountering, then that corresponds to there being some issue or maladaptive, uh, maladaptivity in the beliefs that the organism is currently operating under. And the, this serotonergic system is thought to help to uh, improve the uh, cognitive computation that the cortex is undergoing such that it can hopefully arrive at um, more useful representations, more useful beliefs that are going to be less, produce fewer errors and be less stressful to the organism on the whole. So how does the serotonin system maybe do this? Um, there are over a dozen serotonin receptor types, and they act all throughout the nervous system, not just in the brain. Some are involved in things like digestion, for example. Um, but within the brain, within the cortex in particular, we're interested in two populations, the 5-HT1A receptor population and 5-HT2A. And these are relevant, highly relevant for psychedelics. Um, they're also highly relevant for mood regulation and cognition more broadly. So we can see here on the right um, where these receptor populations are expressed. For 5-HT1A, they're expressed largely in the um, temporal lobe and the medial frontal lobe. And for 5-HT2A, they're expressed more broadly in the frontal lobe, visual lobe, visual cortex, and uh, temporal lobe. Now, what do these do? They, the two populations have a kind of opposing effect where 5-HT2A agonism is postsynaptically excitatory for cortical cells, which means uh, cortical pyramidal neurons in particular, which are the, these are the main like computational neurons in the cortex. And uh, being excitatory means that it make, they condition the cell such that it's more likely to fire. Um, and then 5-HT1A has the opposite effect. It's inhibitory. It makes these cells less likely to fire. And so because of this excitatory effect, 5-HT2A has been associated with this idea of active coping, this idea that um, in response to stress, the system is prompted to um, encode or develop uh, more novel beliefs than had previously been being represented. Whereas with 5-HT1A, uh, the idea is this kind of passive coping where beliefs are more likely to be maintained or um, altered less strongly. So bringing it back to psychedelics then, um, how do these receptor populations interact with psychedelics? Well, a lot of the work has focused on looking at the 5-HT2A receptor and uh, it's been pretty extensively shown that this uh, activating this receptor is both necessary and sufficient for many of the psychoactive and hallucinogenic effects that we typically associate with serotonergic psychedelics. The main changes in perception and cognition, for example, come from this. Um, because of this association, it's the case that Carhart, Harris, and Friston in their relaxed beliefs under psychedelics model mainly associate 5-HT2A agonism with a disruption of high-level beliefs and their capacity to be reevaluated. But it's also the case that many classic psychedelics that are currently being evaluated clinically have non-trivial binding affinity for 5-HT1A receptors. In some cases, they even have greater binding affinity for 5-HT1A over 5-HT2A, um, which opens the question, uh, what is it that 5-HT1A agonism might be doing in these drugs? We know that it's involved uh, endogenously in mood, cognition, and learning. Um, if it's not associated with the primary psychoactive effects of the drug, um, then it is likely that it is involved somehow in mediating those effects, likely in a way that's clinically relevant. Just to drive this effect home, uh, here's a list of some popular and widely studied psychedelic drugs and their relative 5-HT2A and 5-HT1A binding affinities. We can see, for example, that the three most popular and widely studied, psilocybin, LSD, and DMT, all have um, relatively even or balanced binding affinity between 2A and 1A. 
So now that we know a little bit about the serotonin system, these receptor populations, and how psychedelics affect them, we can move on to the model itself. And the computational model that we build and use to simulate cortical dynamics with is based on these two uh, kind of like bigger theoretical frameworks, one being hierarchical predictive processing and the other being energy-based models. And I'll get into both of those now. So first there's hierarchical predictive processing. And uh, this is a kind of like large theoretical framework to understand how the cortex computes and what it's trying to compute and what its learning objective is. Uh, so the first uh, kind of like piece of this puzzle is you take the cortex and you can understand it as a sequence of representational layers going from stimuli to increasingly abstract uh, higher level representations. And that the learning signal that's used to train this uh, system of abstract representation is uh, predictive uh, coding. This idea that uh, at a given layer there is a belief that's being represented at that layer. On the basis of that belief, it makes a prediction about the incoming sensory signal. And there is then a prediction error if there's a mismatch between the prediction and the incoming signal. And this prediction error is then used to both update the belief that's being represented and is then sent further up the cortical hierarchy as the incoming signal for the next layer. The idea here being that a perfectly predictive system would uh, eventually send uh, fewer and fewer signals between the layers, and this would reduce energy costs, metabolic expenditure, um, and would be ultimately most efficient for uh, an organism. We can also imagine that uh, being uh, encoding beliefs, which are highly effective at predicting incoming sensory signals, are going to allow an organism to be maximally adaptive to the environment in which it's embedded. And if that's true, then the opposite is also going to be true, which is that systematic uh, prediction error would be associated with maladaptive beliefs, and these maladaptive beliefs are going to be associated with downstream maladaptive behaviors in a given environmental context that the organism finds itself in. And therefore, the accumulation of these systematic prediction errors um, is associated with the generation of stress in the organism or the system, and also negatively felt subjective affect. Um, an additional uh, extension of this is going to be that this kind of panoply of different mental health disorders that are often associated with, um, that are often seem to be treatable with psychedelics, um, potentially have as at least one of their bases this uh, kind of like systematic maladaptive set of beliefs. And psychedelics then is also going to be targeting this in particular. So within the hier uh, representational hierarchy of the cortex, the prefrontal cortex can be considered the top of the model. This is where the most abstract, high-level representations about self, goals, world, other um, are going to be encoded. It's also the site where things like long-term planning, abstract reasoning, and attentional control take place. In addition, this is where a lot of the neuroimaging work has pointed to uh, psychedelics having a major effect, a major causal effect on downstream um, network connectivity and neural activity more broadly. And unsurprisingly, the prefrontal cortex is also a site of significant 5-HT1A and 5-HT2A receptor populations, as well as uh, major projections of serotonergic neurons from the midbrain. So given the kind of central role that the prefrontal cortex plays, not only in uh, predictive processing more broadly, but in particular in the dynamics of the serotonergic neuromodulatory system and psychedelics, uh, we choose to model the prefrontal cortex in this work. And in particular, we focus on an energy-based model. So what does an energy-based model look like in this case? So we have uh, the prefrontal cortex. It's sitting at the top of this representational hierarchy. It has these recurrent dynamics. It's generating um, neural activity patterns that are being used to predict um, incoming signals. And the dynamics of these neural activity patterns, um, while they themselves are very high dimensional, they can often be projected down to much lower dimensional manifolds. Um, even just one or two or three dimensional manifolds are often what's used in the literature. Um, and these manifolds can be understood as instantiating these uh, energy functions or energy landscapes where the neural activity performs something akin to gradient descent towards an attractor state or a sequence of attractor states. 
And within our predictive processing framework, an attractor state is going to correspond to a stable encoded belief. And these encoded beliefs, of course, can vary in their strength, their precision, the extent to which they're easily maintained or not. And within the framework that we're using, this is going to correspond to the gradient magnitude around the attractor. So greater gradient magnitude, greater precision, greater strength. Um, smaller gradient magnitude, less precision, less strength. Just as a note, um, Carhart Harris and others have uh, referred to these attractor dynamics that have large gradient magnitudes, high precision that are difficult to escape from as canalization. And in the case in which uh, the attractor dynamics that are canalized are correspond to maladaptive beliefs that are systematically producing prediction errors, this is going to be a kind of unhealthy or maladaptive canalization. So with the background information out of the way, we can kind of move on to the novel contributions of our model itself. So as I mentioned, we're building on the predictive processing framework and the energy-based model framework. And in doing this, we are going to try modeling a very simple idealized version of the dynamics of the prefrontal cortex at the top of the representational hierarchy. So what this means practically is that we model a single two-dimensional energy function which instantiates an optimization landscape. And this energy function is the, used to sample neural responses, and it is going to induce a probability distribution over possible neural responses. And the purpose of these neural responses is to predict incoming sensory information. And so we'd like these neural responses to be optimally predictive. Now, in a given environmental context, with a given set of behavioral goals um, and homeostatic constraints, there is going to be a particular distribution of incoming sensory signals that this uh, representational system needs to try optimally predicting, which gives us the optimization goal that we're working under. So you have an energy function that induces a particular probability distribution of predictions. You have some true distribution of incoming signals, and you'd like to match your distribution of predictions to the distribution of, single, uh, of sing <laughs> signals. So I'll walk through a very high-level version of what the algorithm then is that we use. The paper contains many more details, and you can check that out there. So as I mentioned, we have this energy function E. It's instantiating this uh, energy landscape. And we're sampling some neural response Z. So at first, we pick a point at the, on the landscape to use as our starting point. Then we perform gradient descent until we arrive at a, uh, an attractor point that's going to be encoding some stable belief or semi-stable belief. And uh, this is the inference process. We then use that uh, sampled point ZT as the basis of a prediction. But we're, of course, interested in particular in uh, not just energy functions and their dynamics normally, but we're interested in neuromodulation and how, in particular, the serotonergic neuromodulation system is altering, altering these cortical dynamics. So uh, taking as a starting point Hamiltonian Monte Carlo dynamics, which are used as a method of, optim of improved uh, optimization, in energy-based models of neural dynamics, we outline these two neuromodulatory effects, 5-HT2A agonism, 5-HT1A agonism. So the 2A effect, given that it's excitatory, we model it as the injection or adding of structured noise into the la uh, energy landscape at every time step. And the 5-HT1A effect, because it's inhibitory, we model it as a smoothing function over the energy landscape using a Gaussian kernel. So we can expand our little algorithmic diagram here to include, uh, firstly, the kind of uh, pre-neuromodulated energy landscape, which is the ET minus 1 here, and then the neuromodulatory effects, both the 1A effect and the 2A effect, um, which then changes the landscape that is used for the actual inference and sampling process. So once we've performed inference and we've sampled a sequence of points and we've arrived at an attractor, then it's time to uh, use that as the basis of making a prediction. And we get some prediction error and we want to learn from it. So where does this come from in the model? So as I mentioned before, we have some target distribution that we're trying to match. And here that's going to be, uh, or it's going to correspond to E star. 
So we have uh, our energy function, ET. We have the target, E star, and we want to move E towards E star. So the difference at any given time between E and E star can be uh, calculated as the KL divergence between the two induced distributions of these two energy functions. And we, on, in the learning process, we don't actually have access to E star itself. We don't have access to the true distribution in the environment, but we are able to sample from that distribution. So we can take the points, uh, the neural responses that were accessed during inference and use those to generate prediction errors. And then on the basis of these prediction errors, move E closer to E star. And so uh, zooming out a bit, here's the full diagram uh, that corresponds to a single time step of the simulation process. So there are a few more simulation details to get into before discussing the results. Um, firstly, talking a bit about the energy functions. So we uh, represent these energy functions non-parametrically, and we randomly sample them from these different Gaussian noise functions that we've created. And we simulate the effects of the drug using this uh, tuned beta distribution that's designed to be consistent with uh, typical blood concentration levels, changes um, of a drug over time. So for example, you can see here on the right that this uh, drug concentration curve quickly increases. This would be the kind of like early metabolism of the drug into the system, and then slowly decays as the drug is metabolized out of the bloodstream. And we then evaluate these uh, 1A and 2A effects across a range of dose strengths and combinations. So in order to understand the results I'm about to present, it's worth talking a bit about um, the five different metrics that we use. So the first one is the actual energy values associated with the sampled neural responses. These are going to uh, be such that a low energy value is going to correspond to a high probability under the induced uh, energy function and vice versa. Gradient magnitude, I've discussed this one already a bit. So the greater the gradient magnitude on average, the higher the precision of the encoded beliefs is going to be. Then we have local minima count. So this is going to correspond to the number of different stable encoded beliefs. Um, and it's also going to relate to how easy or difficult it is to arrive at the global minima in the energy function. We then also have state visitation count. And this is the number of unique neural responses which are sampled over the course of the learning process. And this we use also as a proxy for the uh, cortical entropy of the system. So in a lot of psychedelics work, um, one of the consistent neuroimaging results that's found is that the neural entropy, the entropy of cortical responses, increases under psychedelics. Lastly, we have the KL divergence between the learned distribution and the target distribution. And this is going to correspond to how well the predictions are going to match the incoming stimuli. So first, we can look at the effects of 5-HT2A agonism across, <laughs> across a range of different dose strengths. We can first take a look at the energy value, and here we see that there is a decrease in energy with increased dose strength, and in particular, at the heavy and max dose ranges, there is a transient decrease in energy value below even what it arrives at after the drug effect. And this is then also corresponding to an uh, increase in the probability of, that, uh, of these responses being sampled by that system. We then also see transient increases in gradient magnitude during the drug effect. This is corresponding to increases in precision or strength associated with the stable attractors. We find a decrease in number of local minima. We also find a significant increase in state visitation count. So this corresponds to, as I said, the typically uh, the consistent neuroimaging result that psychedelics increase cortical entropy. Lastly, we can take a look at the divergence metric. And here we find that 
the divergence between the two distributions actually increases quite a bit during the acute effect of the drug and then decreases uh, even below baseline afterwards. And here's just a visualization of this 5-HT2A effect. In particular, you can pay attention to the right, and you see that the lows of the lower energy values increase, the highs of the higher energy values incre de increase, and the position and number of the attractor states changes and moves around over the course of the learning process. We can then contrast this with the 5-HT1A drug effects that we find in our simulation. Here we find that the energy value it transiently increases during the simulation. So this means that we're sampling less, uh, the neural responses are assigned less probability according to the current learned energy function. We also find that gradient magnitude significantly decreases and gets very close to zero, in fact, for the uh, maximum 1A effect. This corresponds to a decrease in precision or strength of the encoded beliefs. The number of local minima significantly decreases as well. The state visitation count increases, but notably only for the highest dose range, and notably significantly less than with 5-HT2A uh, agonism. Lastly, looking at KL divergence, here we find another inverted effect compared to the 2A agonism, where transiently 5-HT1A agonism decreases KL divergence below baseline and also below where it even arrives at after the effect, drug effect. And we can look at this too, paying attention here to the right, we see that the low energy values become less low, the high values become less high, and the position, location, and distribution of stable attractors does not change very much. Lastly, we can take a look at the effect of balanced mixture of 5-HT2A and 5-HT1A agonism together. Here we find that the energy value decreases over the course of training in a relatively straightforward fashion. There isn't this either uh, big undershooting or overshooting that we saw in the 5-HT2A or 5-HT1A effect. We also find that the gradient magnitude decreases, but not as much as in the 5-HT1A. We find that the number of local minima decreases. We find that the state visitation count increases, and notably increases in a way that's additive relative to the 5-HT2A and 5-HT1A effect, neither of which on their own uh, increase the state visitation count this much. Lastly, uh, we can look at the KL divergence, and here we find that similar to the 1A effect, there's a transient decrease, except in the highest dose range, we see a transient increase more similar to the 2A effect. Um, but also it's the case that the uh, KL divergence, once the drug effect has worn off, is still significantly below baseline. And here is a representation of the 2A effect, the 1A effect, and the mixed effect. And we find here that with the mixed effect, you get kind of, yeah, a mixture of both effects, uh, where you get the movement of the attractor states around, the change in the number of attractor states, the change in the energy function levels, but we don't get the induction of the extremely low or extremely high energy value. So after hearing all this, you might be thinking, well, we're interested in uh, clinical applications of these drugs, we're interested in psychedelic-assisted therapy, and how does this relate to that? So we've formulated two different proxy metrics for what we think are clinically important outcomes. The first is our proxy metric for therapeutic efficacy, and that is the final KL divergence between the learned and target energy function distributions with lower values corresponding to higher therapeutic efficacy. So the thinking behind this is that the greater the match between these two distributions, the fewer systematic prediction errors there are going to be, and the fewer systematic prediction errors there are, that means the less there is maladaptive encoded beliefs, maladaptive behavior, less stress for the organism, and it's more likely that the organism is going to be mentally healthy. We then have our metric of psychological tolerability. So of course it's desirable at the end of an intervention to have a good therapeutic outcome. 
but it's also the case that we want the acute psychoactive effects of the drug to not be overwhelming or dysphoric or too intense or difficult for individuals to deal with, particularly individuals who might be coming to therapy because they're already dealing with mental health issues. So if it's the case that lowering the KL divergence between these two distributions is good and desirable, it's then also the case that increasing it is going to be undesirable. And we calculate a metric of this by calculating the cumulative stepwise increase in the KL divergence over the course of the intervention. And given that the expectation is that the KL divergence will be decreasing during learning, we uh, also refer to this as a non-monotonicity metric. And so we have the long-term outcome as well as the acute tolerability. Uh, we calculate these in a um, unified weighted manner uh, to create a kind of single score that captures how clinically desirable a given um, binding affinity ratio between 2A and 1A agonism uh, our model is predicting. We can first look at the therapeutic efficacy proxy across the range of 5-HT2A and 5-HT1A receptor affinity values. We find here, as you can see in the graph on the right, that uh, both 2A agonism and 1A agonism is able to reduce the KL divergence relative to baseline, but that the 5-HT2A effect is much, more, is much greater than the 1A effect. Ultimately, though, combining both with mixed agonism produces the greatest effect, and increasing dose strength produces the greatest effect. So if this is all we looked at, all we cared about was the kind of like final outcome, we would think that a drug that maximizes both is most desirable. But of course, we're also interested in psychological tolerability. And here we find that tolerability decreases as we increase the 5-HT2A agonism, in particular as we move um, in the very highest like max dose range. We find that 5-HT1A is able to moderate this effect, but only a little bit. We can then look at our overall metric, and here we find that the max max is not most desirable if what we're interested in is um, optimizing for both of these things in a single intervention. What we actually want is to maximize 5-HT1A agonism while uh, having a heavy or medium dose range for 5-HT2A agonism. Okay, so what does all of this mean? We can return to our altered beliefs under psychedelics model, um, which, as I mentioned before, was attempting to account for both the relaxed belief effects and the strengthened belief effects within a single drug. Um, with our understanding of 5-HT2A and 5-HT1A agonism that we've gained from our theoretical model and our simulations, we can then attempt to uh, think a little bit more deeply about how these drug effects might come about. So we identified 5-HT2A agonism with acute increases in gradient magnitude and decreases in energy function values. And so this means the strengthening of beliefs and the high probability associated to those strengthened beliefs regardless of if these beliefs are actually going to be producing large prediction errors or not. So we associate this with a kind of transient overfitting of the energy function to itself, and uh, this is uh, the kind of canonical strength and beliefs under psychedelics type effects. In contrast, we, within 5-HT1A agonism, we see a decrease in gradient magnitude and an increase in energy function values. This means that we see less precision or strength assigned to the encoded beliefs, as well as these beliefs being assigned ultimately less probability mass. Once again, this is regardless of uh, the extent to which they do or don't produce prediction errors. And so then we associate this with a kind of transient underfitting of the model to itself and the canonical relaxed belief type effects that we see in psychedelics. And then Again, we saw with 5-HT1A agonism, there was little long-term therapeutic efficacy. With 5-HT2A agonism, in particular at very large doses, there was little psychological tolerability. Um, but by combining these two with mixed agonists, um, we find that it's possible for one of these drugs and one of these interventions to actually be clinically viable because they gain both the therapeutic efficacy and the psychological tolerability that you would need. It turns out that the classic psychedelics like psilocybin, LSD, and DMT all have this mixed profile, which suggests that it may not be an accident that these are the drugs that people have uh, focused on both 
traditionally in indigenous medicine as well as, well as contemporarily in modern um, scientific research. So given all of this, how can we take this knowledge and try to apply it to novel drug discovery and clinical drug development? So a lot of the work in this area right now is focused on the creation of so-called non-hallucinogenic 5-HT2A agonists. The idea here being that the 5-HT2A agonism is what's therapeutic, but people, of course, don't necessarily like the hallucinogenic effects, especially clinicians. Um, there is some evidence in rodent models that it's possible to create such drugs, but in humans, uh, the jury is still out. There is, in fact, a fair amount of evidence, though, that um, in psychedelic-assisted therapy, trials that have been run, the hallucinogenic effect uh, is actually necessary and very, very relevant to positive clinical outcomes. So it may be the case that rather than getting rid of the psychedelic or hallucinogenic effect of these drugs, what we really want to do is ensure that they're both therapeutically effective and as psychologically tolerable and as comfortable to take as possible. And so if that's our goal, our model actually kind of like points us in a direction to help achieve that, which is to explore the space of biased 5-HT1A agonists, which uh, have this ideal trade-off between therapeutic efficacy and tolerability. It turns out that there's a whole class of psychedelic drugs that have already been discovered, and there's a fair amount of characterization of their binding properties already um, that fit this profile. So drugs such as 5-MeO-MIPT, 5-MeO-MALT um, have been identified, um, have been studied in certain uh, limited contexts in rodent models, um, and I believe, and this work seems to suggest, that these are highly promising candidates or at least the space of these kinds of drugs is promising candidates to explore for the next generation of psychedelic assisted therapy drugs. So I've talked a lot about the model that we've made, the assumptions, the simulations, the results. It's worth pointing out at the very end a few of the limitations, which is that in order to make a first pass at creating a kind of concrete computational model, we made a lot of simplifications and future work should attempt to re-complexify the model. One of the big simplifications is that we assumed a kind of static environmental context in which perception and action loops weren't really involved. Uh, we also used a single energy function, whereas in reality, the cortex likely has many complicated interacting energy functions. We also used idealized energy functions generated from relatively simple um, Gaussian functions. Uh, it would be great to use real neural data um, that's been collected from animals uh, where we've actually been able to characterize um, like the real energy function underlying uh, neural dynamics. We also used a non-parametric model, and this isn't very realistic either because uh, real energy functions are often uh, drawn from parametric models. And lastly, we focused on this uh, relaxed beliefs under psychedelics effect and this kind of theoretical framework in which we think about psychedelics and their therapeutic efficacy as coming from being able to reevaluate and beliefs during the acute drug effects. It's also the case, though, that there's been a lot of work exploring the ways in which psychedelics affect downstream uh, changes in neuroplasticity, and some of these plasticity and learning changes can last for days to weeks afterwards. And taking into account these changes and how they alter beliefs over time is an important next step as well. That's my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I want to thank my collaborators, Veronica, Laura, and Adam. They've all been wonderful in this. If you're interested in learning more about the work, diving further into the methods, into the results, into our literature review around the effects of 1A and 2A agonism as it pertains to psychedelics, um, please check out the preprints on BioArchive. If you have additional questions, feel free to contact me at my email listed here. Thank you.